My guest today is Susie Redding, chartered psychologist, yoga teacher, coach, mum of two, and author of a whole bunch of books, including her latest one, Rest to Reset. Susie, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for such a lovely, warm welcome, Alison. Um, now, you are someone, Susie, who brings calm and sense to my day with your Instagram posts. So first up, a massive thank you from me personally for everything that you do. Oh, Alison, we sustain each other. We do. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> oh, you're so generous saying that. Somehow I, I feel like this this is not a balanced relationship here. <laughs> Sometimes all we need is the kind validation, darling. Yeah. So thank That's you for true. keeping me company. I really how, appreciate it. How has your morning been so far? Because you have just told me that you've, um, am I allowed to, um, am I allowed to share what you just shared with me before we sure. hit record? I asked you what you had for breakfast as I was um, checking the levels and you said, I've just had lasagna for breakfast. Every day is different. <laughs> and we sustain and nourish ourselves however is is accessible right yeah but i love that i love that because if i feel like if if, if if you were to ask me what kind of breakfast does susie have i'm like oh she's definitely on it she's up with you know with the larks she's probably got something you know some sort of um you know um something that she's prepared the night before that's sitting in the fridge and it's got fermented this and it's got you know grains so the fact that you have just like grabbed some lasagna and eaten it at like 10 a.m. before doing a podcast kind of brings me joy. There we go. Permission to be human. Absolutely. <laughs> human <Humaning> with you. <laughs> this is it. So, um, so we're heading into the festive season, which considering life can feel overwhelming anyway, chuck in Christmas and it's enough to send many of us over the edge, isn't it? Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it's... We call it the silly season for good reason, don't we? We do, yeah. Yeah. Um, so let's talk about the pressure that we feel to do all of the things at Christmas, not just because of social media. I mean, social media does, does have a lot to do with it, but also like our extended families. Like, I, I don't know, you know, what other people listening feel like, but I feel like that there's the pressure to, I guess, make Christmas special for everybody in their own special way. And everyone has different needs and different requirements and different expectations. How do you ensure that you're doing what's right for you and your family and not just trying to please everybody? Mm -hmm. I have a really um, a simple strategy, Alison, and I call it the three P's. And I use it in particular um, in periods where there is, as you say, that competing needs, that desire to please all the people all the time. This is the stuff that kind of brings me back exactly to that question of what, what do I need? What does my immediate family unit need and how can we honor that? So the first P is getting clear on purpose. And it's thinking about dialing down all of that external noise and just thinking about where are we at? What have we weathered this year? What's our capacity like right now? And what do we want this period to be about? And using it to set some kind of gentle intention. And it could be, you know, maybe we want it to be about connection. Maybe we want it to be about uh, replenishment, having a break. Or maybe it's, do you know what, if you've had a really tough year, the intention might be, we just want to find some pockets of fun, some lightheartedness. And I think just having that gentle shape helps it's like a roadmap that we can then evaluate this invitation or this request in light of that intention. And if it, it if it's in alignment, then it's an easy yes. If it's incongruent, well, then that takes us to the other P's. And well, the other P's... Before you yeah. go on to the other P's, I just want to um, yes, say that, that that really resonates with me because I feel like, especially with something like Christmas, there is a set, there's a, almost like a sense of sometimes feeling like it should always be the same, you know, traditions and this is how we do Christmas. And actually giving yourself permission to reflect upon the year that you've just had and thinking, okay, so how does that shape how we want Christmas to look and how we want things to be? I feel is quite revolutionary and quite freeing. Mm -hmm. I hope so. You know, it's, it's, it's allowing ourselves 
to do things differently. And you've already named the other P. So the next P is pacing ourselves, <laughs> pacing ourselves. And I, th I think in that there's let's give our health the priority that it deserves. And, and, and that actually requires some time, doesn't it? Mm. So um, it, it's, it's thinking about, okay, do we actually have to get together in December? Or could we actually have a meetup in January? Could we have a meetup in February? That yeah. is okay too. And the last P is permission. It's permission to do things differently. Yes, maybe there was this sense of Christmas looked like this or there was this particular dish that had to be on the table. But actually, what do we need to give ourselves permission to do or not do or to, diff to, do, to do differently? I hope that's that's a freeing that's, statement. That's amazing. So purpose, pace yourself, permission. Those are the yep. three P's. I think yep. that's something that we need to like log in there. So, okay. So if you have that conversation with yourself and you think about the three P's, how do we then navigate those conversations with extended family? Because that can sometimes be the tricky thing where mm -hmm. it's all well and good you being like, this is how we're doing Christmas this year. But there are other people to consider. How, mm -hmm. do, we, how do we navigate that one? Yeah, so I think it's, it's as you say, competing demands, competing needs. Um, it's reflecting on our values. It's coming home to our moral compass and asking ourselves what feels aligned, but it's also what's sustainable. I think, can we just allow that question to, to come into the mix as well? And sometimes that is going to mean disappointing other people. That's that's the truth of it. Um, and I think we've, we've it's... It's difficult, isn't it, when you when we look at, you know, what does our little family unit need as opposed to perhaps our original family unit? How, how can we extend our care and still maintain a sense of connection in ways that still honour what we need? Yeah. yeah, so I think it's about thinking laterally. It's, um, it's a delicate dance, isn't it? It really is. And I think you just easy. reminded me of a, a kind of conversation that you and I had in the comments of one of your posts quite recently, um, where I can't remember what the post was about, but it, it, I shared that I had um, recently cancelled on having dinner with some really dear friends, like friends I've been I had for, you know, 30, 30 odd years. Um, and the reason that I cancelled having dinner with them was because I recognised that I really needed a night in and I thought do you know what uh, if I do go out for dinner with these guys I'm putting their needs ahead of mine essentially because I don't want to disappoint them and I don't want to upset them I matter too and what you just said kind of reminds me of that where it's like yes it's really important that we consider our extended family and you know our big social network wh whoever that may be but actually aren't we just as important too and mm -hmm. if if we need something smaller or different then there's surely a, a way of communicating that. And even if you are worried about disappointing people or hurting people, I guess it's, an, it, it's how you communicate that to them that can make the difference. Yeah, I think it's giving ourselves permission to have needs, giving ourselves permission to meet them. Absolutely. And I don't think this was, certainly wasn't modelled for us growing up. It wasn't encouraged. But these are skills that we can all learn. Yeah. Yeah, and sometimes it's, it, it, we're not just saying a, a bald no. No. It, it's, it, it's maybe, I, ca I can't do that, but this is what I can do. Or I can't do that then, I, I can do it at this time. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's how, how, can we, how, how can we find some room for wiggle while still honouring our own human needs and as best possible, honouring our values because it is really difficult being the dutiful daughter, the dutiful wife, the dutiful mother, at the same time as being an autonomous human being. We are literally pulled in a million different directions, aren't we? It's so hard. I mean, even this morning, one of my five-year-olds was, um, she'd stepped on a wet tissue and her tights, her school tights were wet and she wanted me to go upstairs right now to help her change into some dry tights and I said I just literally made myself some toast I'm gonna sit down and eat it and she was like wow I said to her I am a human I am I'm a person and I matter and I'm gonna sit and eat my toast and once I've had it then we'll go and we'll deal with your tights and it is just that thing isn't it of just just setting that boundary every now and again mm -hmm. and saying no I I am important too 
That's right. And for anyone that struggles that, you know, think about it as this, this is how we resource ourselves. This is how we fuel ourselves so that we can actually have the kind of conversations that we need to have so that we can be present and available for our kids in their moments of need. Yeah. But, you know, we can't just forever be subjugating our needs and expect ourselves to pitch up as we aspire to. It's just, it's not humanly possible. No, it really isn't. Um, So this time of year, it's rife with people glorifying busyness and multitasking, isn't it? Why do you think that we should celebrate solo tasking instead of multitasking? Oh my goodness. You know, multitasking is just a recipe for, for, for burnout, isn't it? Where we really never is. actually feel like we're, we're attending to anything with our full attention because it's not possible. Um, and we all, we never see anything through to completion. We, we don't get that satisfaction of I'm doing this thing. Well, I'm just going to do this one thing. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, there's, there's something to be said for, okay, how can we, like, for example, if I'm folding the washing, well, maybe I want to listen to a podcast at the same time because that, that, that changes something, you know, that's drudgery into something uplifting. But, you know, that's not what we're talking about here. It's this, this sort of sense that we must be spinning all of these plates simultaneously when it's just not how as a machine we're designed to function yeah so i think that can be a really um powerful way to help us slow down is Mm. to think about what what can we just solo task how how can we use that in our day how can we even slightly alter our pace because even something as simple as just walking a little bit slower or talking a little bit slower or chewing our food a little bit more slowly changes the pace with which we're you know devouring life yeah that's so true i mean i i catch myself sometimes sending like a friend or a colleague a voice note on whatsapp because i haven't got time to sit and type out this message (laughs) that's going to take too long so i'm just going to do a voice note and it's like actually come on just chill just take a breath just take a moment Mm -hmm. and if it takes you 45 seconds longer to type out that message then maybe that's okay yeah i think the the mantra that comes to mind there is i have all the time i need now even if we don't believe it the fact is it's more soothing for our nervous system to hear those words repeated than it is to hear on loop i haven't got enough time i haven't got enough time yeah and the fact is like we are just one human being and we're one fallible human being at that can we give ourselves permission just to have the resources of one human? It, it's, it's not possible to deliver all of the things that are required of us to the, you know, the level, the standard that we wish. It's just not humanly possible. So let's, where can we, where can we give ourselves a bit of grace? And I think that really ties into, like this, we, were, we were talking just before I hit record, um, I, I posted a reel this morning about how, I just don't think it's possible to do all of the things that we expect ourselves to. So whether it's um, going to the gym, eating well, medical appointments, remembering your kids' lunch money, bus fares, all the laundry, like all of that stuff that's just like in your head, like to-do list, to-do list. I'm just not convinced that anyone is managing to do all of it all the time. And it, it's like what you're saying, just give yourself permission to not do all of the things all the time. But it, that's really hard because it's ingrained in so many of us, so many of us, isn't it? Mm-hmm. That this is the expectation of how we should be performing as an adult, as a grown up. Yeah. Yeah. Where can we cut some corners? Where can we ask for help? Where can re, we reapportion responsibilities? And I think that is just so, so important coming up to Christmas, isn't it? where we think there's just so much to organise. But in actual fact, does all of that have to land squarely on our shoulders? Actually, no. We've got to become skilled in inviting and requesting and and, and asking. I mean, yeah, in theory, I hear you, but (laughs) it can be quite tricky, I think, whether it's it's with a partner or a child. I've got a 13-year-old and just last night... I asked her to hang up some of her own laundry that we had done like school uniform for the coming week and oh my goodness the drama and 
you know, the emotions that came out and there's the tricky conversations that we're then having around, you know, the expectation of her pulling her weight a little bit around the house and contributing. It's sometimes it can just feel easier just to crack on and try and do it all yourself. And sometimes it is, Alison. Like, <laughs> let's be honest, sometimes it is. Yeah. But again, it's this dance of advocating for ourselves, but also making our life easier in the moment, but also in the, in, you know, our future self. Mm. And I find myself having the same conversations with my 13 year old, but sometimes it's not in that moment where you've asked, you know, I've asked three times to hang up the school blazer and it's still on the floor. And it's kind of, it's not, that is not the time to sit down with her and say, sweetheart, let's take a look. In other moments, it might be at the moment we're going for a, an evening walk when it's dark to, to go and look for foxes. Oh, this nice. is, I don't know where this little rituals come from, but on that walk, we can talk about, okay, so what kind of, what kind of home life do we want? What values are important to us as a family and what, what's required for us to be able to live like that? What do you need to do? What do I need to do? How can we come together and work on this as a team? We've got to keep it on the radar as hard as it is. Let's keep having these conversations and let's keep inviting our children to contribute to these conversations as well. So we're co-creating because I think, you know, one of the fundamentals I've learned as a psychologist is a goal that someone else has set for you is never going to be sufficiently galvanizing. We've got to get our kids involved in what's important to you. What's it's okay for people to think, well, what's in it for me? Well, do you want a tidy environment? Yeah. Okay. So this is what you need to do to contribute to that. Do you want peaceful harmonious family vibes. Well, here we go. Let's let's talk about how we create that together. I love that. I, you've inspired me, Susie. I'm going to, at some point this week, want to pick, pick, pick a moment because, you know, like you say, there's no point in doing it when you're crossed by a blazer being dumped, dumped on the floor. And I'm going to chat to my 13-year-old about the kind of home environment that she wants and, yeah, the things that she can do to contribute towards that. I think that is, that is spot on. Best of um, luck, darling. Best of luck. Yeah. <laughs> I'll let you know how it goes. Um, now, you are quite big on reminding us that for most of us, Christmas or the school holidays or even just weekends don't actually look like they do on social media. Mm. It can be really tempting to try and keep up and then feel a bit deflated because life, especially as a parent, can sometimes feel, a lot of the time, can feel monotonous or a bit boring at times, can't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. And I'm so glad you've mentioned that. You know, we've talked about how, you know, Christmas is a time of squeeze in terms of like demands and stuff. But I, I just think it's it's the comparison that really fuels a sense of oh, we're not measuring up. And it's it's really toxic. You know, in times gone by, we would have seen the Christmas films. Yeah. And the TV shows that celebrate Christmas in a certain way. And now we're, we're privy to this endless stream of, of best bits and look at this dish and look at these presents under the Christmas tree and look at this outing and look at how many people I've socialised with. And it's, it's so hard not to fall prey to that comparison. But I think it's so important that we don't compare how we feel on the inside to other people's appearance on the outside and... and they're just the best bits. They're just the best bits. No one's sharing, you know, the, the pots in the sink and the, the, the <laughs> oh, all of the effort that went into selecting that gift that was then met with. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> that's right. so true. That's, it's that's so true. the pretty reality that we're not, we're not privy to. Yeah. That, and it's really hard to remember. I feel like there are so many things that I, I forget. So I'll, I'll listen to, I'll, I'll watch like a, a reel of yours, Susie, and it will r remind me of something or I'll, you know, I'll, I'll watch something or I'll, I'll, I'll listen to a podcast and it will remind me of, of course, don't compare, you know, your reality to the, 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 the highlights reel of somebody else. That's not, that's not real life. And then I forget yeah. it again. I feel yeah. like there needs to be monthly reminders of, you know, this kind of thing just to keep us all going so that we so that we don't keep forgetting and fall into that I almost find myself spiraling into comparison and feeling like I'm not good enough and then I just need someone like you to be like no come on remember we're up here it's all good 
We need it daily, Alison. We need it daily. And all of my posts are little love notes to self saying, sweetie, <laughs> remember this. And I'm so glad they, they, they land more broadly. But yeah, we, we need, need these it, reminders we? daily. Yeah. We do. Um, so your latest book, Rest to Reset, it came out earlier this year, didn't mm -hmm. it? Um, why do you think that we need to redefine rest? Because I think that this is something that's really important in this time of year. You know, it's seen as something that's quite lazy and indulgent. You know, I feel guilty if I just spend too long watching trashy telly whilst I'm eating my lunch in the middle of the day or even going to the gym sometimes. Like during like a working day, I can feel a bit like, oh, you know, I better crack on. I'm, you know, I've spent an hour in the gym. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think that we need to redefine rest in our minds? I think it's for all of those negative connotations, Alison. The fact is just the mere mention of the word rest has most people squirming in their seats, feeling like mm, it's not okay. Yeah, that's why I wanted to take a look at it. And I think, I think also because by virtue of the pandemic, I think we learned that just being still and, you know, having a brain fade and, you know, I think from that perspective, we had an awful lot of that over the pandemic, right? But we came out of that experience feeling really depleted. So it was kind of like, oh, that's really interesting. Yeah, we're well rested, but we're not necessarily replenished. So what is what is rest? I wanted to take a really fresh look at it. And instead of just equating it with sitting on your own doing nothing, it's like, well, actually, let's look at the root word, rest, to restore. So that's where the rest to reset approach came from. It was thinking about what do you need to bring yourself back to balance? If you spent all day in conversation with other people, well, rest might look like solitude and silence. But if you've been pecking at your keyboard all day, the true restorative act might be sitting on the sofa and holding someone's hand or going for a walk with, with someone and having a conversation. It's, you know, rest is... It's a, it's a deeply personal thing and it's individual to your own interests and your preferences and how your nervous system is wired, but also how you've used your mind and body during the day. And it's also getting clear on the purpose of rest. And I think that lies at the heart of why this is so important to me because rest is how we fuel and resource ourselves. Rest is how we heal. And if we feel uncomfortable about rest, well, oh my goodness, life is tough because we need, need that sort of yielding, that surrender, that softening. And if you don't feel comfortable with rest, then let's call it something else. Let's call it replenishment. Let's call it rejuvenation. And, and hopefully people feel like there are less barriers there. Yeah, I guess that's, for some people that might make it feel like that's productive mm -hmm. so rather than calling it rest calling it replen replenishment well, well that's productive so i can be productive yeah it just comes back to the societal messages that somehow our self-worth is tied up with with what we've achieved and, and and got done i'd love to unpick that a little further but at least we can start with people giving themselves the dispensation to do it and then further down the track, it's how can we change our relationship with productivity, self-worth. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Um, and you describe in the book how advances in technology, as brilliant as they've been for, for many reasons, they've led to us feeling quite frazzled. Tell me more about that. Okay. So if we just take a look at one example of an application of technology, when I was growing up, we had mail delivered once a day. Um, some very fancy people might have had a fax machine. <laughs> there was the telephone, yeah, that was a landline in the hall where everyone else could hear your conversation, yeah? Yeah. Okay, fast forward 40-odd years, yes, we've got smartphones where we're essentially carrying our computer around with us that beeps at us. We've got WhatsApps, we've got emails, we've got oh, direct messages, like the volume of information and communication that we are sifting through on a daily basis. Newsletters that wind up in your inbox, poking at your insecurities, you must buy this thing, right? It is just relentless. We can't possibly, as an organism, evolve fast enough to deal with the advances in how we're consuming information, how we are communicating these days. 
no wonder we are full up frazzled and fried. Yeah? We never switch off. So true. Mm -hmm. This is why rest is essential. This is why we've got to pace ourselves, pace ourselves with compassion. Yeah. I was in a WhatsApp, a work WhatsApp group recently. Um, well, I have been for uh, the last year and um, one person, w- one quite key person in the group removed herself from the group and said, um, if, if it's okay with everybody, we, can we just, you know, can we just communicate on email from now on? And I was like, respect. I am loving that boundary because as, as handy as it has been to be able to contact her and just drop a message or whatever it is, I'm like, no, I get it. Because yeah. actually WhatsApp, having like work brought into your WhatsApp on your phone feels like a kind of a weaker, much weaker boundary than mm-hmm. it being in your email inbox, doesn't it? Definitely. Well, you know, with an email, it's kind of like we're, we're used to allowing, I'll car park that. That's fine. But there is a sense of immediacy with WhatsApp. And I think... Well, they've seen it. They've seen the WhatsApp. Totally. They, they saw it. They and saw conversations it go on, right? Conversations yeah. go on. And then you sort of feel like, <laughs> oh, I've got to stay current. I've got to... It, and it is. Mm. It's, it is. They're, they're, absolutely. We've got to be very clear with what we feel is safe and healthy in our relationships, in, in how we communicate. Definitely. But yeah. I'm yeah. Getting WhatsApps at 7 a.m. on a Sunday morning about a work thing. No, not okay. <laughs> not okay. Not okay. Um, and we're okay, all nodding, so right? We've all experienced it. <laughs> exactly. We're all nodding. <laughs> um, so, Susie, you describe. Uh... I've already asked that question. Um, so, Susie, what do you do to rest and recharge, especially in the lead up to Christmas as things are getting busier? What are the things that you personally do? Okay. There's definitely a seasonal element. And I would say the thing that probably defines my self-care the most is whether it's term time or whether the kids are at home. And the fact is it just has to take a different shape because there aren't the same reserves and resources and same time. I would say that I do have, I call them my energy bank basics. These are the things that are my non-negotiables, but the shape that they take differs. Now for me, movement is really key for my mental health, for my access to a sense of humor. In term time, I go for a walk every morning or a jog, and that is like first up, and I don't quibble on that. Um, in term time, it's a little bit different. It might be rolling out my yoga mat and doing some some stretches on the floor while the kids are doing the PS4 around me or playing Lego around me, and then we go off for a walk and get some nature therapy together. So that's what um, you did during the holidays. That's Yeah, that's holidays. Yeah, but ev- every day there's movement and I, that's what I need to function as a human being. And I don't see that as there's, – there's nothing luxurious or indulgent about that. You know, it's like we, we all know that we need to sleep. We all know that we need to feed ourselves to be able to think straight. I know that I need to move so mm. I can think straight. Um, outside of that, I'd say that the, the biggest thing is, is just – just being tender with myself, Alison. And that, I love that that sort of can expand and contract with how much time that I have. You know, if, I, if I've if i got more time to myself, it might look like a shavasana or a legs up the wall for 10 minutes. When I haven't got time, it might be just tenderly applying a little hand balm and enjoying the scent of that and really sort of letting it be a, a little sensory ritual. And it's always coupled with some kind words. It might be over Christmas, it's gonna be something like, I appreciate me. <laughs> I give myself permission to, you know, to make mistakes. Yeah, kind words. They're the things that sustain me all year round. One of the things that I that you've said to me in, in the past that um, I love, and in fact, I, I, I mentioned it in another podcast that I recorded last week with, um, a lady called Shakira Akabusi, I told her about it, was um, this thing where you give yourself a pet name yes. and as a way of like talking to yourself kindly. Um, tell us about that. Because I, I really, it's something, you know, when you just hear something and it just stays with you and yes. it makes, a, makes a difference. I love that. Well, for people that, I mean, we all know that we want to try and cultivate positive self-talk, kind of self-talk, but it's a really hard habit to break. And research actually shows that if we refer to ourselves using you or I, it naturally tends to create more punitive, critical, judgmental self-talk. But conversely, 
studies have shown that if we refer to ourselves using a pet name, it naturally helps us cultivate more coaxing, encouraging in a dialogue. So for anyone that's thinking, how do I cultivate the habit? Well, there's a simple hack. Pick a pet name. And I love the conversations I've had since, you know, whenever we talk about this, the kind of pet names that come up, things like Cookie. I love it. <laughs> you know? Dear Heart. I, mean, I don't know why I always refer to myself as some kind of animal. And quite often it's going to be two animals together. Chicken Bunny. That works for me. Chicken Bunny. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. It's so true, though, because we, we use those pet names for our kids and it's a way of us showing our love for our kids. So why not yeah. do the same for ourselves? Exactly. Exactly. It really works. Um, so I'm pretty bad at pouring myself a glass of wine at the end of a challenging day. Why do you think that's not ideal? And what are the things I could try instead to release a bit of that tension? Okay. Um, I personally don't aspire to live a life avoid, devoid of, of the odd glass of red wine here and there. But I think it's, it's just being mindful that there, there is a difference between self-care and, and these sort of compensatory behaviours. Self-care is something that nourishes us in the moment and it makes tomorrow easier. And I think that the issue that we have with sugar, caffeine, screens, online shopping, booze, is that they, they all tend to have an impact on our energetic health, our emotional health. They, they tend to make it harder to sleep, right? And we all know how fundamental sleep is to, to mental clarity. So just be mindful of our relationship with these compensatory behaviours. Um, if you are going to have a glass of wine, save the heck out of it, you know. And we just need to make sure that that's, we're not habitually turning to these things as our sole means of coping because of that energetic tax that they incur, okay? And I think it's it just, like you say, you mentioned the word swap, and I think that's really insightful because what we need to recognise is at the end of a busy day, there is a human need. We need to meet that need. But how can we meet that need in a way that doesn't sabotage us? Now, I quite like a direct swap. So if you think about the ritual of having a glass of wine, there's something about a glass, the glass itself is beautiful. And then you're also imbibing something that's, that tastes good. So, okay, so how can we swap that for a non-alcoholic beverage ritual? Now, I love, I've got a, some beautiful china and I love having a herbal tea. That to me has the same sensory qualities. Or I have um, a tall cut glass of um, sparkling water and I add to it a little pipette of either a, a, a batch flower remedy yeah so I'm literally drinking a cup of calm or I quite like a dash has anyone tried those dash drinks that's like no, sparkling water them, with but... like a little twist of lemon and it just is mm. really refreshing so it's can we find a direct swap or is there some other nourishing practice that will meet your need in the moment that calls to you now this is not like if you don't fancy doing something like a little bit of yoga or a breathing practice or a journaling practice well then don't do it Find something else that meets your need. You know, it doesn't, it's not, let's not use our self-care as another form of striving and efforting. There needs to be something soothing. Maybe it's um, using a product that we really enjoy. I, I quite like a magnesium body butter because it's um, the anti-inflammatory properties. They help me sleep better. But there's also something lovely about that, the application of it. You know, there's a real gesture of, of care and tenderness. So it's just finding what resonates with us as human beings. Yeah, I like that. Um, now, mum guilt, you know, we all know that we've all suffered from it. it we all, mm. you know, we all deal with it. Um, but you think that guilt can actually come in handy at times, don't you? And that it's actually a messenger sent yep. to get us to check in with our moral compass. Tell us a little bit about that. Okay. Let's imagine a world completely devoid of guilt. That would be one messy, chaotic place. This is not something that we want to aspire to. However, as you've just said, guilt serves as a messenger, inviting us to check in with our moral compass. So the presence of guilt doesn't actually mean that we're about to do something wrong or we've done something wrong. That's where we need to check in and go, hey, okay. Is this thing that I'm about to do, is it congruent with what matters to me as a human being? 
Is it taking me closer to a life that I aspire to live or is it taking me away? So we can take the nourishing action even in the presence of guilt. And I would also add that maternal guilt, like quite often, I think it's, it's an expression of love. We mm. love our cherubs so much. We want so much for them, right? So underneath that guilt, dig a little deeper. And I, 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 I reckon you're going to find an enormous reservoir of love. And can we bathe in that instead? Yeah, I like that. It's so true. It's just like things like um, one of my five-year-olds has got a bit of a snotty cold and I sent her off to school this morning. And as I was walking away from the school gate, I felt guilty. I was like, maybe I should have kept her off. And it's like, you're, it's so true because actually she's fine at school and I'm not a bad mum for sending her into school, you know, put, give her some cowpaw, in she goes. Um, but you're right. The reason that I feel that, that kind of pang of guilt as I'm walking away from the school gate is because I love her so much. Mm. Yeah. You love her, you care for her. We yeah. just need to yeah, hang on to that thought instead of yeah. the, um, the negativity, negativity of, of the guilt, don't we? Exactly. Exactly. What lies beneath? Exactly. Um, so you're, you're big on encouraging us to do something for ourselves every day. How much of an impact can that have? And what if we just don't feel we have the time? Ooh, okay, let's address don't have time first, okay? It can be as simple as how we speak to ourselves. It could be as simple as how we dress ourselves, what we feed ourselves, how we move our bodies, how we stand. The fact is we are doing these things anyway, how we breathe. We're doing these things anyway. So none of these things have to take any more time. But if we can do them with a little bit of tenderness, it changes potentially completely how it feels. Okay? And for anyone that's feeling like, oh, I feel so bad about doing it, it's, it's hard. You know, I think we've received so many messages growing up about being selfless. You know, selflessness is a virtue. And it goes right back to, you know, even how we conceptualise a good baby as, as one that doesn't cry and doesn't trouble its parents. So yeah, true. And then it's, it's perpetuated our whole lives long with the good girl narrative of you know, keeping everyone else happy and subjugating your needs. And then we've got the selfless daughter, selfless mother, selfless wife. No wonder we feel so uncomfortable. And I think it's, it's, it's so much bigger than not giving ourselves permission to meet our needs. I think it's, we become so estranged, so cut off that we almost don't even know what we need and what we want and what would make us happy anymore because we're so used to, you know, left, right and centre tending to everyone else's needs. So, you know, I think sometimes that's a stumbling block where people feel like, oh, I should be taking care of myself, but I don't know what that looks like. And I would just invite people to be super gentle there, be really, really gentle. And, and this is about how can we come home to ourselves? And for some people, you know, maybe they, they didn't feel safe doing that growing up. So it's learning a whole new skill set. And this is, this is the power of therapy. Um, and I think every human being can benefit from that. But I think it, let's, let's take a look at where the barriers lie and, and just be very, very gentle in that process of acknowledgement and but at the same time, remember, we can do things differently. Yeah, we can change the script. We can give ourselves permission to come home to ourselves and decide for ourselves what, what our, you know, where our values lie. Yeah, that's really good advice. And also, I would say that on that, um, your Instagram broadcast group is a mm -hmm. great place for just on a daily basis thinking about what do I need today? What, you know, what do I need to do? What can I do to do that one thing for myself, to replenish myself in some way? I've had such fun with that, Alison. It's been lovely. And I, you know, every day it makes me think, how can I just, is there a little tweak here? Because I think, you know, we've got to keep things fresh for them to feel resonant. And, and the fact is it does need to keep evolving because our needs keep evolving. So I'm loving the conversations that we're having there by virtue of, I, I, I invite people, I, I give some inspiration, then I say, but what, what would you say? Tell me, 
pop it in a direct message and then we can add it. So we're co-creating these, these lovely, lovely little polls together. Yeah, it's great. It's so, so good. I definitely highly recommend anybody to, who's, if this conversation has resonated and you feel like you want more from Susie, I think the broadcast channel is the way to go. Um, Susie, thank you so much for joining me today. I feel like you have given us so much, so much to think about and contemplate. And I feel like anyone who's listened to this will be on their way to having a more restful Christmas. Restful, yeah, let's go for a restful Christmas. It can, it can be restful, right? It can be restful, but you know, it's like pick and choose. What is it? What is it that you want? I, I'm I'm going to go with peaceful. I I fancy a peaceful Christmas. Yeah, it's permission to choose. There we go. Yeah. You said it beautifully, Elson. Thank you. I'm going to have a think <laughs> about what kind of Christmas I want, and I'm going to get get back to you. But whatever it is, I'm going to I'm going to try really hard to make sure that it happens because so, I matter. As I said to my five year old this morning, I matter too. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> thank you so much for joining me today, Susie. It's a joy, Alison. Thank you, darling. Always a joy.